Just a quick announcement, I am co-hosting a read-along called Harry Potter and the Virgins, which is where a group of booktubers who have never read Harry Potter, including myself, will try to read each book every month in the new year. That means in January, we are going to read Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and then do a live show on my channel on Sunday, February 2nd. Check out our Twitter as we post more information to come. going to spend my Saturday night giving myself a haircut and packing my suitcase because I am flying to San Francisco tomorrow morning. Here is my sad little suitcase over here in the corner. I'm just bringing a carry-on because I'm only going to be in SF for two days and I will talk more about why I'm traveling over there but first, a long time ago I made a promise that if Skillshare sponsored me again, I would read the last book of A Court of Thorns and Roses which is A Court of Wings and Ruin. They ended up sponsoring me three more times, so everyone was like, when are you gonna read Aquawar? And I'm like, bitch, <laughs> I didn't really want to. But a promise is a promise, and I said that next time I go on a really long airplane flight, then I would go ahead and lug this book with me so I can just bang it out in one go. Just like how I imagine the characters in the book will also bang it out in one go. My goal for this trip will be to get through this entire 700 page book. I also and bringing with me A Court of Frost and Starlight, which is the novella that takes place after the series, I guess. People were telling me that I need to read this one too because it's the worst book of the series. First of all, I don't know why you bitches keep on recommending me books that you think I will hate because that's not how recommendations work. I'm packing these two books with me. Hopefully, I won't jump off the plane. Just get it over with, you know? I'm tired of this shit haunting me. I'm tired of people saying, please read Sarah J Mass. Bitch, I'm tired. Also, my flight tomorrow morning is gonna be at 6 a.m. So I'm gonna be extra brain dead on top of reading this crap. I really feel like I'm testing the limits of my brain here by just seeing how many brain cells can I lose by waking up at the butt crack of dawn and reading other butt cracks in this book. See you tomorrow. All right, I am gonna narrate my journey starting A Court of Wings and Ruin. I attempted to vlog and then my camera dropped. What else is new? Every time I read the series, I have to take off the cover because ain't nobody catching me reading this shit in public. Also, every time I start the book, I have to say a little prayer for myself. All right, here we go. This is a scene where Feyre slut shames a priestess for making her moves on Lucian. I learned that consent is only important when it's the woman being the abuser. That's feminism for you, baby. Feyre's knees are barking. I don't know how that's possible, but I guess we ran out of verbs. Reese's eyebrow arched beautifully. What does that mean? Like they arched ugly before? Every bone in my body barked in pain. Here's what I'm wondering. Is Feyre a dog? Somebody just said that someone has a wing fetish. And then Reese says, you've really mastered the swaggering prick performance. And those are the highlights of the book from this morning. I finally made it to San Francisco all in one piece. I definitely could have finished it during the whole plane ride, but I decided to take a nap. Some parts in between, I just wanted my brain to take a break. I am on page 580. I have a little bit over 100 pages left and then I'm fucking done with this shit. My thoughts on this book, where do I even begin? Okay, here's the thing. Am I on crack or is this actually better than the other two books? People were saying that the third one is going to be the worst one and that I'm going to hate it the most. In actuality, out of all three, I would say this shit is the best one. I don't know. I don't know what the fuck is going on anymore. I mean, that's not saying much because I probably will still rate this like two stars, but still everyone said that this was the worst book. Is it just me? Like, have I just lost my brain? Maybe I have, I don't know. I don't know what the fuck is going on anymore. I just, for some reason, felt more engaged than I did when I read the second book, which felt like an unusual form of torture, but I just felt like there was more happening in it and it wasn't such a slog to get through. Like in the second book, you were just stuck with favorite moping around for like the first third of the book to really emphasize how she's in such a terrible relationship because there's no such thing as nuance in this book. In this one, at least she's finally out of her rut. She's kind of embraced her powers and is now like a badass bitch, which questionable, but at least now she's doing shit. The nicest thing I could say about this book is that I appreciate Feyre and Rhysand truly embrace each other as their equals. In the second book, I felt like it was too heavy handed, but then this one, I 
is toned down a bit more where I'm like, okay, I see what you're doing. It's not too obvious and it's not in my face as much. So I respect it more. I can't believe I'm even saying this shit. Ugh. I feel like I'm going through Feyre's emotional character journey where she has been so used to awful shit for the past two books. And then when something is slightly better, she's like, wow, that's amazing. That's how I feel going through the first two crappy books and then getting to this shit where there's like a little bit more substance. Basically what has happened so far in the first 580 pages is that the book starts off with Feyre painting something. I don't know what she's painting. It's still abstract as fuck, but she's painting something because she has to put on the role of a very complacent, obedient girlfriend for Tamlin. I totally forgot that she got stuck with Tamlin by the end of the second book. Fortunately, she did not end up stuck with him for long. Lucian miraculously grew a spine and he's like, hey, you wanna get the fuck out of here? And she's like, hell yeah, I do. Because he found out that one of her sisters, Elaine, who he met for like five seconds is his soulmate. And just that very novel knowledge of that woman being his mate that woman that he's only known for less than a minute, that's enough for him to grow a fucking spine and just get the fuck out of Tamlin's place. And then they get reunited with Resand and his crew of people who are like this found family, but they're like the most boring found family ever. I just don't care for any of their fucking banter. She's like, oh my gosh, I'm finally home. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm bored. There was like this one priestess that was a big ass hoe that was trying to take advantage of Lucian, but then Feyre like fucking broke off her hand or some shit like that. And she was like, you will never take advantage of another person without their consent. And it was like this whole paragraph about how no means no and consent is important. And I'm like, you know what? Good for you. Consent is a topic that would have been nice to cover in the first book when you were with Rhysand, but I guess it's different because the priestess is a woman and not a hot guy like Rhysand is. So she's a hoe and she needs to be villainized. She also has to deal with her two sisters who have turned into fairies because they fell into a cauldron at the end of book two. Now they gotta deal with the traumatic repercussions of what happens when you are a fairy. Nesta has not really been any different. She's still like this stuck up bitch with a stick up her ass but Elaine is like a checked out bitch and she's just saying like weird shit about what she sees and people are like, oh my gosh, she must be going mad. There's no way that all these visions that she's talking about possibly could have anything to do with the fact that she fell into a magical cauldron. It makes more sense that she's just delirious instead of discovering her newfound fairy powers. So we're just gonna ignore the fact that she's saying all this weird shit until 300 pages later. Stuff happens, there's some plot, but that's not really important. What's really important is the fact that finally, this book is giving us more sex scenes. That's what we're here for. Sarah J Maas just needs to embrace her streams and just embrace the kinkiness. We barely got any of that in book two, but now she's back with a vengeance in book three. I have some thoughts on various sex scenes, but I will reserve that for my video review. What I will say is the one that has stood out to me so far is the one where Feyre and Rhysand are in a tent and there's like a war going on outside and people are dying and she decides to give him a blowjob. Hey man, it's for morale, okay? I am not comfortable with elaborating any further because there are windows across from my own window and someone just unfolded their blinds and I think that they're looking at me talking about this shit. So now I am very self-conscious. Speaking of which, let me now talk about why I am here. I am in San Francisco because I am currently in the middle of a few job interviews. I've been looking for a new job because lately I have been feeling pretty unfulfilled at my career current one. I knew I had a very nice job and that I was living comfortably and the work was fairly easy, but lately I just haven't been feeling happy. This is a very privileged problem to have, but I want to reach like maximum privilege where I have a choice in what kind of work I want to do. Generally, it's very rare for you to enjoy your job or find meaning in your job. There's no guarantee that I'll feel content or happy anywhere else, but I figured that if I'm going to work on something that I don't feel totally fulfilled by, I might as well do it back in California where I'm closer to my friends that would help me have a better work-life balance and just be overall better for my mental health because I want to find a better variety of work where I'm not just Google's bitch. This is not to diss on Google. It is a lot of people's dream place to work at, but it just ain't for me. I am hoping that I am privileged enough to have a choice in 
determine what work is for me. One of the jobs that I applied to is to be an art director at Twitter. They were very nice to book my flight and my hotel and also cover my transportation and my meal expenses. So all of that is already a good sign. I'm a simple hoe. I like getting free stuff. So I'm convinced that this is a place that I would want to work for, but I don't know if they'll hire me. We'll see. Tomorrow is going to be my interview where I meet the rest of the team in person and I try to be like a normal person instead of somebody who reads Sarah J Mass books. <laughs> and after that, I have another in-person interview. That agency is working with a few clients like Starbucks and Adobe. I was able to schedule an in-person interview with them right after I finished my Twitter one, which means that I actually get to stay in San Francisco for an extra day because that agency is also paying for a different hotel hotel for me. I know these interviews are happening so that they can evaluate me, but really this is two-sided because now I can evaluate what kind of hotel are you picking? Is it bougie or are you being a cheap ass? Because that will matter when I try to suck up your resources and money later on as an employee. I also have a phone call interview with Facebook because I also applied to be an art director there. The thing is about these interviews is that I literally just throw in my application at random places like Twitter or Facebook and I think, eh, they're probably not gonna contact me anyway. And then they do, and I'm like, oh shit, now I actually gotta pretend like I'm competent. Now let's talk about the hotel that Twitter set me up for. I'm staying at The Marker, San Francisco, and I am loving how this hotel is. Like, it's kind of tacky, but I think it's on purpose, which aligns well with what I tend to do with my life. Let me show you around my room. I just really like how colorful the rooms are. There's this big ass mirror over here so that I can feel like a bougie bitch. There's some kind of princess bed so I can feel spoiled. There is a giant window where my neighbors are currently watching me vlog and act embarrassing. I like how each of the nightstands are different patterns too. Like this is the one on the right side. This is the one on the left side. This is my workspace. Let me show you the bathroom because this shit is so tacky but like i'm digging it still i am digging the marker san francisco i think it is very playful with their patterns and colors and i approve take a screen recording of us working in bed together. I'm just gonna cut right before we have sex. <laughs> Victoria and I just got back from dinner and this is how much we spent. <laughs> no! Victoria's watching my videos for the first time. I didn't even know this was a thing. I want to know who this bitch is. I've watched basically every one of your videos. Really? Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I'm just eating, I like, I leave it on. Don't really? Because I miss your voice. Do you ever fap while watching me? <laughs> you not supposed to see that on camera. Can you count? Count and just fall. Oh my god, I'm telling you guys. What? This clown pulled out his phone during a concert and was playing Pokemon Go. This is a video. Dude, if you drop your phone, that would really suck. <laughs> Here, this is his live version. 
I'm definitely not going to be reading any more of A Court of Wings and Ruin for the rest of the night because I need to wake up early and also I need to preserve as many brain cells as possible before my interview in the morning. I want to talk about what happened before my friends left. It was such a serendipitous moment that I wish I had my camera with me. Basically, Brandon went home a little bit earlier. Victoria and I lingered a little bit to chat. She told us earlier today that she is thinking of finally pursuing music full-time. This is something that she has always been really passionate about and she has been doing as a hobby. She's so talented at it. She just has never really pursued it as like a full-time thing or something that she would dedicate her whole life to. She's currently working as a project manager at a construction site right now. And originally she took that job because it was a way for her to get stable income with the assumption that she could pursue music on the side, but she kind of lost the bigger pay picture and would often take the work home with her and spend way more hours just getting extra work done to be better at her job. And now she's kind of reached this crossroads where she's like, what has she been doing all this for? That has what brought her back to wanting to do music full time again. A huge part of her inspiration is John Mayer. She was showing Brandon and me a couple of videos of him performing live. This sparked a discussion between Victoria and me about how it is so admirable to see people wholeheartedly pursue a craft that they feel so passionate about. I really want to be at a place in life where I discover something that I just love so much, whether it's writing or traveling or whatever. I just want to find that passion and be able to just dedicate my whole life to it and unabashedly embrace it. A lot of times I just feel like I wasted eight hours every single day working in an advertising industry where the work doesn't really matter to me at all. Instead, I just think about all the things I would rather be doing like traveling to Budapest or writing my novel. They've all just been thoughts and I haven't really acted upon any of them. Similar to how Victoria is so obsessed with John Mayer and admires him so much for the crap that he does, but she isn't able to unabashedly embrace music as her life passion either. So we said goodbye and I offered to walk her out to the elevators. And then when we reached the elevator, I was like, you know, what? I will walk you downstairs too. We went ahead and took the elevator together. I was already in my pajamas. I wasn't even wearing shoes. I didn't bring my phone with me, hence why there's no vlog footage of it. But we went downstairs. The lobby was completely empty, so we actually ended up wandering past the grand staircase. And there was a fireplace at the very end of the room. And we just naturally gravitated towards that fireplace and sat next to it. And we started talking about our lives and our futures or like what we want to do or what we're uncertain about doing. She was saying that she was afraid of just diving into it because she has so many doubts about it. Literally right when she was in the middle of talking about it, suddenly the live version of Gravity by John Mayer plays in the lobby. Gravity is the song that she was playing in my room earlier when she was talking about music and why it was so important to her and why this song in particular was so amazing to her. We were just so stunned that out of all the possible songs in the world that my hotel lobby could play at that very moment, it played Gravity by John Mayer. What are the chances of that? So she started crying and I started crying too because a bitch was feeling some sort of way. Talking about gravity and how it holds you down but how you have to keep on moving. Having that song play the night right before my big interview, I don't believe in fate or things happening for a reason. I think that this was purely just coincidence but I told Victoria that even though this is a coincidence, I think that we need to still take it as a reminder. It's not technically a sign because nothing really is a sign, but we need to take it as one. We need to just fucking suck it up and pursue the shit that we want to do and stop being afraid or holding ourselves back. If you are privileged enough to have an education or have a job or live fairly comfortably, then you have the means to pursue what you want to do and it's in your control to an extent. We need to stop holding ourselves back and just fucking do it. I, for so long, have been holding myself back on doing a lot of things that could have brought me joy in my life. I'm not saying that I should have quit my job and just become some kind of nomad and travel the world or whatever, because obviously, you know, that's not realistic. I probably would have died in a ditch somewhere, but I could have at least done more for myself to take closer steps 
to doing the kind of shit that I want to do instead of passively letting my life slip by. With everything that's been going on and with the changes that I am making, by taking these interviews and removing myself from an environment that no longer inspires me, I can try to take closer steps to a path to the kind of life that I want to have. I don't think that my life is gonna be dedicated to Twitter or wherever I end up, but I do think that I am heading in the right direction. I'm gonna continue figuring out what I really wanna do with my life. I wanna believe that I'm capable of more and I don't want to let that go to waste. If you're still watching this, thanks for bearing with me as I go on this very cheesy rant. But if there's something that you have really been interested in or that you've wanted to do, but you've held yourself back from doing it, just fucking do it. Life is already so fucking difficult that you shouldn't be holding yourself back from doing shit that you actually enjoy doing. If you spend your life doing stuff that you don't even care about, what is the point? The world is already a shithole, so the least that you can do is just try to pursue things that you actually like. I hope that it works out for both you and me. I will try to bring you along for tomorrow and see where that goes. All right, good night. finally did it. It's finally over and I'm fucking tired. <laughs> I interviewed with 10 people today. 10 people. I can barely talk to one person in one day. These interviews were literally back to back. Person after person, I had to pretend to be interesting and engaging and well-rounded and smart and competent. I can barely pretend to be like that in front of one person. The fact that I had to do that in front of 10 people today is an accomplishment in itself. Now I'm just resting in my new hotel room, drinking in some the cool thing about Twitter is that they seem to be way more interested in my side projects that I do for fun instead of my actual client projects. That speaks to the culture where they're looking for more well-rounded people who have actual interests outside of work, which is nice. One of the interviewers had asked me why I transitioned from business to design because I had originally started off as a business major and then I just quit everything and pursued design instead. And I was telling her that I came to a point in my life life where I realized that as a woman of color, your life is going to fucking suck regardless. If I'm going to struggle anyway, I might as well struggle doing something that I enjoy. And she gave me a motherfucking high five in the middle of the interview so she knew what the fuck was up. I definitely tried to channel as much passion and energy as I could in the hopes of looking like a very energetic, appealing candidate instead of oh, a lazy piece of shit that I feel right now. There was another interviewer who I actually did a video call with. I had asked her, a question and then she answered in a way that was a bit rambly and she was like I'm sorry it's Monday morning and my brain is scrambled and I was like girl I feel you I'm literally just saying words as I go along and just hoping that it all makes sense and then she laughed because she thought I was joking jokes on her. By the time I was like on my fourth or fifth interview, I could already tell that my throat was getting strained because I was so tired from talking all day. I could not finish the lunch in time because I had to rush over to my other interviews at this other workplace. I have mixed feelings about them. I thought their work was pretty cool. They seemed impressed. I don't know. Maybe they're acting. Who gives a fuck? And if they are, fuck it. I'm acting too. Isn't interviewing just a bunch of people acting? That's what it is. Oh yeah, something that I forgot to mention was that this morning 
morning when I was trying to find an Uber so that I could go to the Twitter headquarters, my Uber was taking forever to pick me up and I was freaking out because I didn't want to be late to the interview. So I was just on my phone and I probably looked kind of panicked or just had like a weird form of resting bitch face like I usually do. And there was this girl that was on the same street as me and she kept on looking at me. Her eyes were like widened as if she was like really surprised. She kept on opening her mouth and closing it as if like she kind of wanted to talk to me but I wasn't sure because I had never seen her or met her before. I just didn't think anything of it and I tried to catch my Uber. Later on, when I was sitting to wait for my Twitter interview, I checked my Twitter, ironically, and I saw in one of my notifications that there was a girl who tweeted saying that she saw me in San Francisco. And I was like, oh shit, that was the girl that I saw on the street. She probably thought I was such a bitch because I was like, like really trying to find my Uber and inwardly panicking that I would be late. But I thought it was cool that I went to like a different city and somebody recognized me. I DM'd her because I think we are both leaving San Francisco tomorrow. I don't know if we're gonna be able to hang out, but I think it would be cool if I got to meet up with another person in the bookish community. I don't know why I'm doing this to myself because I just talked to 10 fucking people today, but I guess I just like to tire myself out. I don't know. Victoria is also gonna swing by later tonight to hang out with me for dinner. So it's basically just gonna be a day full of socialization. This is good for me, right? This is good. I shouldn't be so much of an introvert. Yeah, this is good. I need to socialize more because that way I don't have to socialize for the rest of the year. And I'll show you a little bit of the hotel that I am in. Here is my hotel. When you first walk in, there is the bathroom. Speaking of which, this is now mine. Wait, body lotion? I don't use lotion. Okay, forget it. Now we have the rest of the room, which has two beds so that I can feel even more alone. It has a giant mirror so I can feel even more ugly. This painting is kind of cool. It's like, who is she? Who is this woman? And why is she so bougie? And it has a bright red dresser. This is the only thing that's colorful about this entire hotel room. If we were to compare both hotels, I would say that the first one wins, which is another reason why I should join Twitter instead if they give me an offer. much greasy food and then when we came back to the hotel you really wanted to hoard some more soap <laughs> and I wanted to hoard some toothpaste but the, the dude knew what I was trying to do he knew what he was trying to do but he gave me the toothpaste he was like do you if we were gonna give you stuff so we'd have to like bring it up to your room and I'm like I just want some toothpaste and then when we went to the elevator there were two elevators <laughs> doors open and I went to the one that was crowded as fuck <laughs> instead of like, the empty sardine. one because I was so caught up in the euphoria of getting all this toothpaste it was like I lived in a world where there was only one elevator I didn't that notice elevator. I was caught up on the fact that we claimed toothpaste <laughs> and I did it for you we haven't even brushed my teeth yet we just ate so much garlic fries I know our breath smells like garlic we're very sexy tonight I'm just vlogging to procrastinate on taking a shower because I don't want to I'm gonna zoom in on your face instead you were supposed to take a shower like an hour ago. I know. <laughs> I'm a dirty girl. <laughs> Tell them about how this hotel is haunted. What was it room 823? Someone like killed themselves. Uh, the owner of the hotel killed themselves or something? But the thing is- There's always gonna be someone that died in a hotel. Everywhere you go, there's always somebody who died there. Everyone has died everywhere. Yeah, it is. Billions of people that have lived on this earth, they've probably died everywhere, including every hotel you've been in, every place you've worked at, every place you ate at. Everyone has probably died there. Some Somebody died in this specific room? Everyone has probably died in every room. <laughs> <laughs> also, I'm not afraid of death. I'm just like, bring it on. <laughs> Ghosts can't haunt you if you are not afraid of death. It is almost 10 a.m. now. I need to pack up and head to the airport, but I just wanted to give a quick update because I know I haven't talked about reading for a while on this vlog. Obviously, the past few days have been pretty busy. But excuse me if I was not able to prioritize fairy dick. My plan is to finish A Court of Wings and Ruin on my first flight, and then I can start on another book that I brought, which is The Immortalist by Chloe Benjamin. I decided I'm gonna hold off on reading the 
a novella because I don't think I'm strong enough to read two Sarah J Mass books back to back. So you'll have to just <laughs> be patient with me because I am not as strong as you think. One moment I wanted to mention is that after I filmed that clip last night where we talked about how the Sir Francis Drake Hotel is haunted by all of these stories about ghosts that pull your leg when you're in the shower or weird rattling noises or whatever, I turned off the camera so that I could go shower. I turned on the water and I was getting ready to step into the shower. All of a sudden, the door started rattling and I was like, oh, I guess it is haunted. Guess I'll die. Millennials wouldn't be the type of people who would be afraid of ghosts because we don't care about dying anyway. I'm gonna go ahead and start to get dressed so I look less like a hobo. Hopefully I make it to my flight. No disastrous thing has happened yet while flying, so maybe this time it will. I don't know. Update, I actually finally ended up hanging out with Michaela. We saw each other in San Francisco yesterday. You saw me and you were like, and I, I was like, my, my jaw was on the floor. Now that my flight has been delayed by 10 plus hours, I managed to sneak over to your terminal and got to meet up with you before you would leave for your flight. So we just <laughs> had lunch and we've been chatting and uh, we will continue to chat without an awkward vlog camera presence before you board your flight. So yeah, just an update. back home and I look crusty as fuck which accurately reflects how I feel because I am so exhausted and tired I've been stuck at the airport pretty much the entire day yesterday and then I had to go on a flight overnight it was very uncomfortable and cramped so I don't think I got much quality sleep at all I finished the last 150 pages of A Course of Wings and Ruin I guess I just had different expectations for how the finale would go it's like the final stretch, you know? So I thought that Sarah J Mass would really go hard with all the sex scenes just like for the final climax, literally and figuratively. We didn't get that. We just got plot instead. I'm like, girl, we're not here for plot. Give me like the weird smut scenes that you fucking write. We're not here to see the resolution of the war, which was a hot mess, by the way. It was like a hundred pages of melodrama that I did not care for at all. People were fucking like nearly dying but not actually dying. Resan died for a few moments and Pharaoh was freaking the fuck out and she's thinking, oh my god, please don't die. I need you. I'm so codependent on you. Girl, he's not gonna die. Chill out. The dick is too good for him to die. There was this one random side character that just suddenly came out as liking women and she went on this whole <laughs> melodramatic monologue about how she realizes that she is attracted to women but she's had to keep it a secret for so long. It was like this whole melodramatic, gay, angsty shit that I thought was so random to just insert in the last hundred pages. The story is about to end and then it's like, oh yeah, by the way, this character is also gay now. Sarah J Maas was like, oh shit, I forgot to add LGBT diversity, so let me just sprinkle some at the end. When I get more sleep, I will properly try to accumulate my final thoughts and overall thoughts and I will put them together in an actual book review video. Review is a strong word, but you know what I mean. If you made it this far in the vlog, thank you for joining me along my journey for the Sarah J Mass books as well as my personal journey. Hoping it works out. We'll see. Hi, Cindy from the future giving an update. I ended up getting an offer from both of the places that I interviewed at. So I canceled my call with Facebook because I chose to go with Twitter. Turns out having a bougie hotel really does convince me after all. Don't forget to unsubscribe from my channel, especially because I look very crusty right now. And goodbye. Gravity. It wants to bring me down Curse twice